In the absence of John Dimmitt, I call this January 16, 2018 business meeting to order at 7.34. Roll call, Ruthann. Member Carter. Here. Member Hall. Here. Member Patton. Here. Member Fisher is here and Vice President Rollins Gay. Here. Are there any additions, corrections, or modifications to the agenda? No, there are not. <laughs> At this time, I ask that anyone that would like to make a citizen statement would come forward. I see there is none, so we'll move on. There is no call for executive session. Correct. Correct. We need now the approval for the agenda. So moved. Second. All opposed, same sign, motion passes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All. All. Anyone opposed? Okay. All opposed. Same sign. Motion passes. Commendations. We have some commendations, recognitions to announce. I'll let you go ahead and do that. Okay. Urbana High School Habitat for Humanities Who Club recently received a grant for $1,800 through the Southern Poverty Law Center mm -hmm. and Teaching Tolerance. Yes. The following Urbana Middle School staff presented to the State Association for Middle Level Education in December, their topic, Restorative Practice. Tracy Welch, Restorative Practice Facilitator Cindy Sykes, Guidance Counselor Eva Martone, Social Worker, and Melanie Fairchild, Dean. Mm -hmm. Any administrative reports? Yeah, um, our first one up tonight is a dual language expansion update. And uh, we're gonna ask uh, Dr. Joe Wiemelt, who's our Director of Equity and Secondary Bilingual Programs, and Ms. Lupe Riccone, who's our Director of Elementary Bilingual Programs, to give us a kind of an overview of where things are with our uh, current dual language program as well as what the future holds for uh, dual language programs in Urbana. So, Joe Lupe, take it away. Good evening. Good evening. So, just before we get started, I just want to take a moment to um, thank our staff, our dual language teachers that have joined us this evening. Um, who continue to provide um, excellent service to the students and to our families, but also um, continue to support the growth of the program. So i take a minute. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so we've come here tonight um, to provide a bit of an update uh, about um, the current status of our dual language programs and where we're envisioning moving forward from here on out. Um, so as you're very well aware, currently our Spanish dual language program is very successful and there is much desire from the community to participate in this program. So much so that um, between um, our populations that we serve, um, we're actually seeing a need to expand our programs. Um, there's a lot of interest from the community as well as um, the, um, which has led to some increased class sizes for our dual language classrooms. Um, so we are here tonight to talk about exploring some, a variety of options um, it, as a way to provide better services for the students within these programs. Um, in addition to our Spanish language program, we are also seeing a large increase for our French um, speaking students as well. Um, so we are looking um, to have discussion about expanding um, French dual language for those students and families as well. Um, one way that um, we are looking to get some feedback about the expansion is through using the thought exchange program that we have used in the past um, to poll our um, staff and families um, from early childhood through fifth grade across the district to get some um, feedback from them as far as what they think um, would be reasonable expansion options as well as for the French program seeing which of our school zone areas would be interested in housing the French program. Um, in, a, in addition to that, Dr. Wimel and I have um, been making plans to stop by staff meetings and PTA meetings to kind of talk about these expansion options um, and gather feedback and ideas from people um, there as well. 
Um, the Thought Exchange Survey, we as well have been looking into ways to um, make sure that we make that accessible to families um, in a variety of different ways, um, at different meetings, um, in buildings, different parent events. Um, and we've been working with our parent liaisons and parent coordinators um, to look into options for that as well. So we're here tonight really to get some feedback from you um, as well as um, just to um, let you know that this is kind of how we would like to move forward at this point. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you. So some of the, some of the things we're, we're considering for the thought exchange just to provide a little more uh, information is providing some uh, thoughts or options for possible expansion, what that could look like. Um, and so some of the conversations that have already been happening in regards to how you can expand dual language would be looking at a variety of, of ways. So they could explore um, adding additional classrooms within the two schools that are there, um, expanding in that way um, through attrition or through other classroom spaces that are available, if there are, um, as well as another possibility could be looking at one dual language school um, and have be a lot of reshuffling of students, but that is one way to explore the expansion. Another way we could look at is adding a third site of Spanish, and with talking about French, that would then also be an opportunity for another site for, for French. So thinking through some of the options, that's obviously kind of the initial thought processes, thought processes that we've had, but also interested in any thoughts that you have. All of this we would like to put kind of written out as options or possibilities on Thought Exchange and get direct feedback from staff, community, families about their interest in how to expand Spanish and if we are, uh, if folks are interested in expanding French. And so, but if we were able to do both, um, that expands the opportunities for more students to participate, more students to become bilingual, and it's definitely the path. I remember last time I was here, we talked about, um, from the trip I had to Spain, my, the importance of looking at ways to expand for more opportunities for more students to become bilingual see this as really good options for that. So we're interested in your thoughts before we proceed and any suggestions you may have in terms of options or things to consider. Board members. Very exciting to think about. And I remember the thought exchange when we did it before. I mean, I kind of vaguely remember how it, how it worked. But, but we did offer it to community members. It wasn't just for families in the district. It was for, mm. for interested people. And it sounds like this would be the case as yep. well. We could explore um, that the same way. And I know that our existing programs have been very popular. Have, have, has the new interest been expressed by um, native Spanish speakers or native English speakers or both? I mean, what's, what's pushed the, the popularity interest? Where has it been coming from? So part of the expansion is that um, our incoming student, the number of incoming students has been increasing over um, the past few years so the, the of our Spanish speakers oh, uh -huh. so these are students that are identified as English language learners that we are that we provide services to through our programming uh -huh. um, and that number alone has been increasing when you then also include the addition of um, native English speakers um, or, or native bilinguals that want to participate in the program as well, then um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. that, that has just naturally created an increase in interest. This year was the largest wait list we've ever had, um, the largest amount of applications mm -hmm. we've ever had. Oh. And this incoming kindergarten group next year looks to be projected as the largest group we've ever had at kindergarten for s students who um, identify as speaking Spanish at home. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I thought, well, who's on the wait list? Because I thought we were obligated, either legally or just because <laughs> it was our practice, yeah. to provide mm -hmm. services to, the, to native Spanish speakers. Yeah, all, all native Spanish speakers, uh, particularly who are ELLs, uh -huh. automatically are in the program mm -hmm. if the families want. Okay. That's part of the reason why our class sizes are, are larger, gotcha. to accommodate every student who enrolls through that process. Okay. The wait list is for students who don't speak Spanish at home at all, gotcha. native English speaking or English only families, uh -huh. or families of other languages that are applying in. Gotcha. Um, okay. We kind of cap the <coughs> limit, uh, the number of spots for those students, uh -huh. and, um, and that then, once it has been capped, we have a long waiting list of families that are applying to get in from within the two school zones of Leland, Dr. Williams, and every other school in the district. Cool. And I just have one more question, if I may. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, all the options that you kind of spelled out as possibilities all sound very exciting, and I can see advantages to each of them. 
I assume that we would only, you would only put out options on this thought exchange if they were actual options, I mean, meaning that you could imagine us being able to staff and, and afford, because mm. obviously some have higher price tags than others, mm. and that you would only offer those options that we could seriously contemplate offering, right? I, I mean, because you'd hate I to offer so. something and yeah. have everyone say, great idea, and have us say, there's no way we could possibly staff up yeah. uh, five schools with, yeah. you know what I mean, we don't have enough. Yeah, we haven't, we don't have specific language yet for the uh -huh. thought exchange because we wanted to explore that with the board, but that's something that we can talk about making sure that anything that is put out on thought exchange is actually doable. Yeah. In, in terms of budgets and, and personnel constraints, as you mentioned. Yeah. But no, they all sound like yeah. exciting prospects, so mm -hmm. thank you for mm -hmm. getting us to this place. <laughs> Other board members? I just have a question then about the French population because I know mm -hmm. that I've seen uh, really it's raising high on the Congo population moving mm -hmm. here to Champaign, mm -hmm. especially in that Orchard Downs area. And I just want to know as far as our school system, and they do not speak English, has that risen this year? I know last year it had started to rise, mm -hmm. but has it? Compared to last year, I would say the number is slightly higher, but even last year we had a very large number of um, students, of French-speaking students. Okay. So if I could just follow up on that one, uh, Lupe, when, when we talk mm -hmm. about starting a French uh, dual language program, can you talk just a little bit about how that would roll out, kind of the, the vision for for how that would take place. Sure, so um, the part of the thought exchange survey that would address the French dual language program at this stage is really um, reaching out to the community and the families um, and the staff as far as an interest <coughs> right now. So um, because the way that we have um, populated our dual language program for Spanish, um, the English speakers are typically made up of students that live in that school assignment zone anyway. Um, not to say that that's the, the process that we have to continue, but that, that is what we have been doing. So ideally, we would want to explore putting the French dual language program in a school zone area where there is a lot of interest. Um, so right now, that's kind of our initial step, is to see where the interest is um, from the families and the staff, and then from there we can move forward um, as far as the development. And you would build that up year by year. You'd start with kindergarten, first grade, and build up like we d have done with mm -hmm. Spanish. So our, Span our first group of Spanish English dual language students are in sixth grade this year. So mm -hmm. we were here six years ago having this conversation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I know in the past you had said one of the challenges for starting a, a French dual language program would be finding uh, staff mm -hmm. uh, that were qualified. It, it, has that changed? So this year, Dr. Weemelt and I have um, been fortunate enough to be able to start getting more staff. Um, through TAs um, and through um, just interest. Um, so we were able to get an additional French teacher this year at King. Um, so now they have a teacher and a TA providing services there. Um, Dr. Weemelt can talk about the additional staffing at secondary level. Um, so. Yeah, we, we've been able to, to find more staff members, um, some who have been in education, some who are interested in uh, a second career path towards education Good. that one of the flexibilities um, with licensure in Illinois is if you have a bachelor's degree in any field and you're bilingual, as de demonstrated by a language proficiency exam, and you enroll in a licensure program, you can get a temporary license, a mm -hmm. transitional license, while you're going back to school. We have a couple people on those licenses mm -hmm. right now who speak French. One is actually a trilingual, French, Spanish, and English, that is ex going back to school to become teachers. So we're going to have to engage it in similar ways as we did Spanish several years ago and think creatively, maybe grow our own, um, of our own staff members and those sorts of things. Uh, but we're seeing a stronger pool, more people interested who speak French, who are interested in going in education. So I think it's, it's doable. Um, and what we found with, when we started dual language, then we got more and more applicants from people from across the, the state that were interested in working in dual language. And I would believe that that would happen with French too, based on that past practice. Now we have lots of candidates applying who speak Spanish. That's almost, it's still an issue and it's not quite as good as the monolingual candidates we get, the number of monolingual candidates we get, but it's, it's a growing pool of candidates that we now see who want to come and work in Urbana, like oh, several of the, the educators in the back. So, okay. I see it only growing with French. Okay. 
Any more questions? Okay. You might have mentioned this, but just to kind of wrap up, when do you anticipate the thought exchange going out so that members of the community can be looking for this, or families at least? So we're anticipating the rollout date to be the 29th, okay. um, which is the end of this month, and Great. having it be live for um, two weeks. Awesome. So we'll make sure that everyone gets access to that link when so it's available. With that and the conversations that we'll have with staff members and PTAs, uh -huh. uh, meetings and those sorts of things, we can plan on coming back in February and having an updated, um, here's what the Thought Exchange has told us here, our, our suggestions, recommendations moving forward, and bring that back to the Board of Education for further consideration in February, March. Because your hope is that we might be able to roll these things out for the next school, the upcoming school year. Yeah, or in at August. least start. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Some phase it in starting start in the fall. Phase yeah. Oh, very exciting. That's great. Wonderful. Great. Any more conversation? Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank You're doing sure. great you. work because I brag about it all the time. <laughs> Kindergartens are yeah. speaking Spanish. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's great. Well, we're lucky to be in a community that, that fosters it and supports it, a Board of Education that supports it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So our next uh, administrative report is actually something that um, Board Member Patton uh, had seen a presentation, I believe, at the uh, Champaign Public Library um, from the Champaign County Racial Justice Task Force and asked if we could have a uh, similar presentation from uh, the members of the task force and the, the uh, co-chairs to, um, to come and present to us. And so I will invite them up to the microphone. Um, and it's Amy Felty, Sarah Bagloyan, uh, Dr. Samuel Bindham was also one of the co-chairs, and Ryan Hughes, who I believe was uh, secretary of the, of, the, right. of the task force. So uh, just make sure that you press the button to make sure the green light is on your microphones before you start. And Lori, if you'll hit the lights for the uh, PowerPoint. Well, just before we begin this, though, um, can I make a quick remark about the bilingual education thing? <laughs> Just really fast. Mm -hmm. um, in 2003 and 2004, I interned at the Inter-American Magnet School, which is a bilingual school in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing experience. It's pre-K through eighth grade. They had pre-K, <coughs> kindergarten, first, completely in Spanish. Any kids could be in the program, and they learned in Spanish those three years. And then I think English was introduced at beginning in second grade. And by eighth, eighth grade, the kids were all doing all of their Spanish and their, I mean, their science and their math and their Spanish literature, reading and writing in Spanish. And then they had English literature and writing and their social studies and one other subject. And I, it's escaping me what that other subject was. It might have been history, but I don't think they called it that. I think social studies covered it. And the research collected by the time I had been there was over 20 years worth. And they found that by the time those kids left eighth grade, they were, they were excelling their peers in other Chicago schools who were just all English. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah and Ryan and I are here at Samuel's invitation, and we thank you. We're going to speak kind of briefly. I'm going to talk mainly about the voices of the community part of our task force work. And I think Sarah will probably begin since we have a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so just a brief introduction, the racial justice task force. Uh, there we go. Um, began uh, several years ago. We committed about two years worth of uh, meetings twice a month and um, divided up into subcommittees. Um, the focus be became um, really about the criminal justice and juvenile justice system as a way to re reduce racial disparities um, in Champaign County and those systems. Um, obviously, there is some connection with schools and, and other community um, components. And uh, part of one of the subcommittees or groups that we um, that we had was uh, led by Amy and interviewed um, several people, f lots of people from the community. And so we thought it'd be most appropriate for her to start um, as a lot of the feedback from the community was really relevant to young people and to education and um, to other 
issues uh, outside of the, the justice system. Uh, we'll, we've got some handouts about the justice system recommendations as well that are related to fees and fines and other things, um, but don't want to take up too much of your time with that stuff, so. <laughs> Brief. And the ball bounced. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm going to look at 10 different recommendations very briefly that have to do with the voices of the community. We interviewed about 100 people. From that 100, we called about 100 different responses that were mostly repeated across people to put in our 33 recommendations. You won't find all 33 yet, but you'll find 18 of the recommendations that the voices of the community presented to the county board. Those 18 were culled from the others and included in the final report. In February or March, we'll, our subgroup of Henry Ross and Artist James and I will present our whole report to the county board special. We're getting a date for that. But what we found was that um, in our interviews with people, we could almost divide people into groups. We had people from Champaign, people from Urbana, people in different county areas, in Tolono, in Muhammad, in Rantoul, and then a few country people, meaning outside of city limits, bust into schools. <clears throat> we had people who were older, um, I'm 68, so we had a group of people who were, who went to high school in the 60s in Champaign-Urbana and older, and then we had people who were in the high school in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which was a different time. I mean, you could even subdivide that. And then we had people in the 2000, up to 2010 currently in school in that decade. We had boys and girls, we had black and white, we had immigrant and native born, we had special ed and not, we had so-called gifted and regular class uh, participants. Some of the students were ones that I had taught when I was teaching. I was at Uni High in the 80s and I was at Central High School in the 90s and early 2000s. And I was particularly interested in what had happened with the students that I had taught too. And so, what we found was there were very different responses depending on where people were. And I'd like to concentrate on the Urbana responses more than any others because they were probably the most positive of the ones that we found. Um, across the board though, people said, people who were of color or immigrants said, I wish there had been more teachers who looked like me. Teachers who looked like me. It wasn't, I needed an aide who looked like me, or I wanted the janitor to look like me, or I wish the cooks looked like me, or the deans or the counselors. It was, I wish I had teachers who looked like me. And one of the recommendations that people made was hire people who look like me. So you have to take a look at who your students are and make sure that they're represented in ways that are respectful. That is, ways of people who make policy decisions. And I think Urbana's working hard on that, quite frankly, from what we heard. We recommend the expansion and the sustained use of the National Name Exchange. Now, I don't know if you've heard of that or not. That was founded in 1976. The National Name Exchange is a consortium of 55 universities in our nation which annually collect and exchange the names of their talented and underrepresented minority students, both at high school level and then at undergraduate level in colleges. The high school kids then are help to get into colleges that specialize in what they want to do and what their aptitudes are and their desires are. And the colleges uh, specialize in helping their undergraduates who graduate get into graduate programs that again further them and, and push them forward in their knowledge and learning. We heard about the program mostly through um, Dean Marietta Turner at Parkland, who's an enthusiastic supporter of this. The University of Illinois is also involved in the national name, it ch name it change, but I didn't find anybody in the school systems, the high school systems, who knew of this program. So Parkland U of I pushes that, and I would urge you to look into that. The third recommendation we made was to discuss race and racism openly and honestly in the schools. Um, I'll read what we wrote. Interview is called Discussion of Race, the Element in the Room in Champaign County. African -American, white student, African American and white students are separated by an equity gap. Someone said not an achievement gap, but it has to do with access to people who look like them and to the knowledge that people have that they can get. 
um, you realize that last March the high school here in Urbana showed the film Racial Taboo to all the freshmen and the seniors in high school. We talked to some of the students who saw the film there and to parents who had seen it in our 11 some community showings and I think three private so-called so private showings. And the students who were, who were able to talk about it and who were willing to talk about it said there needs to be more discussion of race. The literature and the uh, history classes that they take need to have more open and honest discussion of all aspects of race. There's a book by Andrew Hacker called, um, mm, help me out here, uh, ho um, Three Nations, Hostile, uh, da, 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 da. Andrew Hacker wrote a book <laughs> that we used at Central in the late 1990s that looked at the, at the race issues in schools, and it talked about the nation itself. Um, there's a book out now that a book group is cutting called White Rage. Chapter three and four, especially uh, chapter three of that book, details how we got to a racial inequity in our school systems, White Rage by Carol Anderson. It's an award-winning book. It's a very difficult chapter to read, but chapter three details what happened with the Brown versus Board of Education response across the nation. And it's not hard to see that we have effects of it here in, in the North as well as in the South. But I think Urbana, again, from what the students said, is working to begin to overcome that. Students said that um, um, the fourth recommendation, this bleeds right into it, is to end the system of detentions and suspensions. Students said, sometimes I feel and smell fear in teachers that have never met me. And less so in Urbana, but in many students said, many, especially young black men, and some black women students would say, I walk into a classroom and the white teachers who don't know me, especially the women, just automatically seem afraid of me sometimes. Not all, you know, and, and they're obviously struggling with this, teachers and students. But that's the kind of thing they would like to discuss. But they want to discuss it in a way that's open so that we can get past it all and they can have access to information where they're comfortable. And they said the system of detentions and suspensions is something that uh, is, um, some students call them holding pens, the rooms that they're sent to for dispension, dis suspension. Um, and again, I don't know Urbana's whole system. But youth said that's not what we want because most of us are here to learn. We're here to overcome the obstacles that any normal student would face in learning, so help us do that. Again, I think the discussion that goes on at the high school here, especially the one around racial taboo, which I got to sit in on part of, begins to do that as students get to speak up. And I know, too, that teachers and administrators here try to be in touch with students and try to learn what the students are thinking and facing. What are the opportunities that they can grasp? And what are the barriers that keep them from things? The fifth recommendation we made was to initiate training in implicit bias as part of professional development for all school personnel. Staff, teachers, aides, building administrators, building staff, counselors, district administrators, everybody, parents, board members, all of us need to be aware of implicit bias and what it means. And probably the best book I've found for that, for white people to read, is called um, Waking Up White by Deborah, I think her name is Debbie Irving, I-R-V-I-N-G. And Debbie Irving's book is a white woman looking at how she came to understand what white privilege was and then what she could do about it because she found out in it what implicit bias really meant. And it really broadened her ability to understand and then to take action to eliminate those things. That would be a good book for students to read and study. I'm an old high school English teacher. So I'm all for kids reading these things. We found, sixthly, that we needed more trauma-informed counseling in schools. And again, I think that Urbana's doing this. You have trauma training started. Uh, I know you also have implicit bias training started because I've talked with Don Owen about this. Um, keep it up. You can't, w you can't lose. The seventh recommendation we had was specifically to Champaign, but that is to retire the SRO system, the school resource officers. 
um, I talked with several school resource officers and teachers and people involved with that program and with students. <coughs> we have a lot to say in the footnotes of our full report that we'll present. But what we'd like to see and what people, parents in the community recommend is see all of our kids as adolescents who are growing up with normal adolescent needs. We're all on different tracks. We all can think back to where we, where we were learning and what we were doing. But we don't want our kids seen as pre-criminals. And to have uniformed officers in schools carrying guns doesn't send a message that kids want. And so one of the things that we're recommending is that um, Chancellor Jones at the university and his vice, one of his assistant chancellors or assistant chancellor, vice chancellor, Asada Zarai, um, is to team with Don Owen and Susan Zola and then the new Carl Medical Center and have one of the long-term projects be to have a class of graduate students look at this SRO program difference between Urbana and Champaign because Urbana doesn't have the same implementation. And what you have is more of a check-in system, I, as, as I understand it. You'll have to figure this out on your own, where <laughs> you have officers kind of to guide and to be on call and to assist and so on, but you don't have officers in uniform with guns in offices in the school or in the hallways. And Urbana seems to be having good results with that, increasingly better. Champagne's problems people tell me are worse and worse. And they say, oh, we need more officers. And the response that I hear from people is, from the parents of students who are African American in particular, is no, we need no officers. We need counselors. We need adolescent development people. We need our kids to be treated like anybody wants their kids to be treated. So if our kids are having trouble, address the troubles, please. Those seven recommendations are the bulk of the um, education part in the shortened report. We have a section on intergenerational trauma and we're also recommending, and we'll soon talk with Dr. or with uh, Chancellor Jones on this, that Carl and the university have an inner, uh, an epigenetic study done in the community to see how trauma has crossed generations because we have 350 years of inequality. Um, we're 150 years after the end of slavery now, but the effects of that have not been um, addressed and epigenetic studies go from one generation to the next. There's a program in Canada that we reference in our report um, that, that shows some good things that the Canadian government is doing to try to recover the adolescents and the generations who were sent to boarding schools among their Native Americans and the, the things that they're doing to help there. There are other places in the world that are approaching epigenetic or cross-generational trauma um, that are very good. And I would love to see Carl Univers and the university approach such a study because we have a wonderful chance to do it here in our community. Two other things are we advocate um, that the schools everywhere have special programs where they identify children and youth who have incarcerated parents or incarcerated close relatives or caretakers because the needs of those children can be very different. And when a child is in trauma, no matter what kind of trauma is, he or she can't really learn. You can only do one thing at a time and engage your brain fully. And if your reactions are unsafe or fearful or worried all the time, you can't really learn. And it's not the kid's fault. It's, it, we can fix that trauma stuff. We, we can't fix it. We can approach it and do better. The last thing is please support us with more of the racial taboo work I hope that the high school will consider showing it again to the freshmen this year and getting those students involved. Um, the final two things I want to say are I want to compliment Urbana. Um, it was a real pleasure to interview people, both in the system and in the community. I find that people really believe that truth emerges when there's open consultation and people are sincere and they're listening. They don't have to agree and they don't have to have the same ideas or opinions ever, but they do have to listen sincerely to one another with the bent toward what's the best for the most people. And um, I would advocate that each one of you on the board take an elementary student, a special interest in one elementary student in February, one middle school student in March, 
and one high school st student in April and do your best to um, get your employers to set aside a time so that you can really learn what that student faces in school. You know, forget the teacher's problems and forget the parents' problems and forget all those things, but try to figure out what that student encounters in a day in school and pick someone who's not like you. Pick, pick someone who is either struggling with something you don't struggle with or someone who's, who's whom you're concerned about. Don't, don't pick the ones that are quietly making their way through a system. And see if you can figure out what barriers there are for that student and what opportunities there are and how those students can be brought into more opportunities. Um, because in that way, you will become advocates for patterns in the system, for changing the things that you see as blocks and hindrances and creating the things that you see as helping all kids go forward. We need to act. We don't need permission to do this. We're all in this together. And as they told us in Chicago, which one of the, one of the things I learned that was wonderful was parents send their best kids to school. They don't keep the good ones at home and send us the bad ones. They send their best kids and we should be honored to have them, and, and I think we are honored to have them. So we have to treat them as these are the kids that parents trust us with. We have to do a good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, board questions? I well, just, okay. uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Peggy. You uh, go. Well, I, I was just going to say thanks for the important work that the task force has done, and I hope the presentation to the at the county level next month or in March is leads to some further work at the county level um, but I especially appreciate the reminder about what what's needed to advance racial equity in our schools and um, and I appreciate your kind remarks about Urbana because I, I am I am proud of the steps we've taken in Urbana to, to identify systemic racism and complicit bias through, through our racial equity sort of to your initiative I think it's been it's, it's moving us in the right direction. We're far from being there, and I think everyone would, would acknowledge that, but <coughs> helping staff and administrators and teachers and board members alike know what obstacles need to be removed for us to have true racial equity. So I guess, I guess just two things kind of come to my mind. Is one is I, I do look forward to how we will be more explicitly involving students in that work, and I understand that's sort of the next phase um, in getting them more explicitly involved in, in racial equity work, as, as you recommended. Um, and secondly, I'm, I'm curious how we can, how some of the, the work that we are doing currently can complement the work of the task force. The, the thing that comes to mind is, I know you didn't talk about it a whole lot this evening, but I know in the, the main report that you made to the library, you talked about the importance of restorative practices as being an, you know, an element going forward. And I know we've, you know, we we're, have a couple years down that road in our journey and have had tremendous success and wonder if there are opportunities for, you know, joint professional development between, you know, our staff and, and, and those that you'd be recommending, you know, have this training. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, uh, actually have a statewide nonprofit that does restorative justice work and work closely with Mikhail and Elaine, and I know um, the great steps that, that Urbana has taken, and I think the next, um, the way to integrate the two is really to look at preventative and educational opportunities like circles that are really just about uh, creating a safe space for conversation, but not just students, staff, um, need to be doing this too because there is a lot of relationship building and community building that needs to happen um, in order to make that safe space to have some of the hard conversations mm -hmm. and what we're finding in Champaign is that we have to really start with teachers in a building and staff in a building so that then they can actually experience that, um, a talking circle or a sharing circle or even a circle on race before they can do that with their students confidently. Mm -hmm. um, so at some of the elementary schools in Champaign, they're doing morning circles for 20 minutes where they're really using a, a, you know, a talking piece in the process to just introduce the day, get settled, um, make build relationships other create some shared values of how we want to be treated and kind of check in on those things throughout the the school year um, but the staff are finding that to be beneficial for themselves as well having the time to do that is is difficult of course um, so the restorative practices piece is um, very is can be preventative as well as uh, in response or intervention practices and um, I think 
having the results at the intervention level like you've had is often encouraging to staff to then be more open to it. You know, we want to yeah. see that this is going to work and, and going to happen. So I think that mm -hmm. that would be the next step um, that mm -hmm. I would advise on that, on that piece. At the community level for restorative justice and the criminal justice system, we've, it's a lot about diversion as well as prevention. So mm -hmm. um, it looks the same in, in schools. Um, time yeah. and resources are always the, yeah. the catch, mm -hmm. but, um, but it can definitely make a difference if uh, we yeah. you know, allocate the time and, and, um, and are explicit about it. We're gonna talk about race. We're gonna talk about challenges or barriers mm -hmm. that we have. Um, but we also want to talk about the good things, too. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's um, important. Great. So thank you, thank Peggy, you, for, for that. Thank yeah. You. Anyone else? I just want to say I was at the discussion with race, uh, racial taboo. It can be a continued. I was at the one at uh, Stone Creek. Um, and some of uh, my staff came, too, that I work with. Uh, it could be a continued uh, conversation because I was the only African American out of our staff that did come with our group and they were very well invested. But I'm going to look outside. I just, the box, what you're talking about. Kids can't function if they're going to a dysfunctional home. And some of the things that you had on your report, housing, Mm -hmm. Reunification is such a big factor when their parents, and it's big here, are being released from prison mm -hmm. and they can't go home to their kids because of certain policies. Mm -hmm. So that's stated. So I want you to continue your work because they bring that to school, mm -hmm. what's going on. They want that parent. And it's not only the dad. Now it's mom and dad have been and they're coming out. And I'm seeing that. And Urbana is working with it. But like you said, it's a community. We've got to go outside that box so that we can do the family reuni reunification. So I like that piece. And the other thing is, Yes, we do need to talk about race more uh, at home and in the classroom and maybe even start book clubs that you mention a book for these kids to talk about these topics because a lot of kids don't understand the cultures. They only understand their culture. So doing some things like that would be innovative, but you all are doing such great work. I hear about it all the time. And I just want to thank you. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Okay. So, did you want to nope. do something? Okay. Nope, you're good. We have no need for public hearing. Nope. Um, okay. Would you like me to read through them? I can do it. Okay. December 9th. at three, th I'm sorry, you couldn't hear me, $3,909 in adult education at 83000 Interfund loans, we had none. So 11.04 personal personnel items. Kathy, did you have anything that you wanted to be recognized? So is there a motion to approve the said consent items? So I move to approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. 
Okay, Ruthann, roll call since we were talking money. Member Carter? Yes. Member Hall? Yes. Member Patton? Yes. Member Pulaski is yes. here now? Yes. Member Fisher votes yes, and Vice President Rollins gay. Yes. Action items. We have the following gifts, and I'd like Brenda to read them. Mm -hmm. Okay. The following donated to Urbana Adult Education Center. Dorothy Newman, John Muirhead, Leslie Philman, Leon Mary Schmidt, totaling $1,800. Champagne West Rotary Charities, Champagne donated the Tin Cup Award for August Student Transportation for Urbana Adult Education Center, valued at $268.01. Kathy, I don't know how you say it. Maniates. 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 And Paul Selvin donated $1,500 to Urbana Adult Education Center for bus tokens for the students. Amy Owen, Minnesota, donated $300 to her Evelyn Burnett Underwood Music Fund, $100 UHS Girls Cross Country Team, and $100 to the UHS Girls Soccer Team totaling $500 to the district. The following donated to the UHS Student Senate Thanksgiving dinner. Dodd's Company, Busey Bank, Urbana Park District, Senior Citizens Club, totaling $300. Mark Penning, Northfield, Minnesota, donated a Getson Coronet valued at $1,000 to Urbana Middle School Program. Eva Steger, Urbana, donated $3,500 to the Urbana High School to purchase a new marumba. New Free Will Baptist Church donated $200 to the Evelyn Burnett Underwood Music Fund at Urbana Middle School. Margaret Fleck, Urbana, donated a 4-4 violin case bow valued at $650 to Urbana High School Band Program. The following donated to the Michael Pollock History Scholarship Fund. Ann Willard Broom, Sarah Barnett Nemeth, Ellen Jacobson Isserman, Mariah Ryan, Glenn Laura Morrison, Michael Stacy Rue, Thomas Kathleen McCoy, Dave Dutton, Diane Marlin. Cash donation from multiple donors totaling $1,015. I recommend the board send thank yous to the previous mm -hmm. gift people. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have a motion to accept the gifts? So moved. Second, do we have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. There is no call for a future special executive meeting, mm -hmm. superintendent's report. Yeah, just a few quick things. One, um, I think it's a good, good night to mention that, in, especially in light of the Racial Justice Task Force presentation that you had tonight, um, that we have um, coming up next at our February study session, in addition to the Urbana Middle School School Improvement Plan presentation, we'll have a presentation about our restorative practices work to date. Um, so that fits in really well with one of the recommendations. And then, um, at our February business meeting, we will have uh, the school improvement um, plan from Urbana High School, and along with that, we'll have a presentation about the school resource officer program here in Urbana. Cool. Okay. Um, so our goal as administration was kind of tying these things together, and um, as our presenter said tonight, um, it, it's good to look at ways of, of kind of combining these things in terms of how we're working together across the community to um, to work on the recommendations of the mm -hmm. Racial Justice Task Force. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's my one. And then um, in terms of um, was kind of my equity in action, in terms of excellence, okay. I just wanted to highlight a few things um, from this past weekend. The Martin Luther King recipients. I know um, acting board president. I get to call you acting board. I'm going to call you <laughs> acting board president. Uh, Benita Rollins Gay was uh, was telling me how amazing um, some of the uh, student essays were, mm. um, and I'd just like to highlight that uh, during the Martin Luther King Jr. community-wide celebration, um, Urbana had uh, two scholarship 
no, I'm sorry, three scholarship winners, um, Asia McMullen, uh, Shari Gonzalez, and Gage Kirtner, um, and they received scholarships from the um, from the Martin Luther King Scholarship uh, Task Force. And then we also had uh, two of those students, um, Sherry Gonzalez and Gage Kirtner, right. were highlighted at the uh, prayer breakfast at uh, the Vineyard mm. Church on Monday, mm. uh, yesterday, and um, and their essays were kind of highlighted as, as two of the best essays that were presented mm -hmm. um, by uh, mm. by high school students across the community. So very proud of um, mm. all three of those Urbana High School mm. students, and as well as the huge number of uh, students, staff members, and community members, parents, family members, who participate in the activities this weekend. Um, it's, it is uh, truly one of the um, mm -hmm. things that makes this community so, um, so amazing is the way uh, we celebrate someone who was uh, truly a revolutionary in more ways than one. Um, and it's good to remember um, both his calls for um, unity, but also his calls for justice and, and radical revolution. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm very proud of those students, and uh, I'll end my report there. Okay, any other board reports? I just want to emphasize you all, it would be nice to have Gage, because those, er, those winners, <coughs> mm -hmm. one was African American, mm -hmm. one was Hispanic, and Gage is white, and mm -hmm. Gage touched us very much. Mm -hmm. Amy's shaking his, her head. Mm -hmm. Gage had me mm -hmm. almost in tears, mm -hmm. and to find out that this young man was an Urbana student and endured all what he endured, mm -hmm. it, it was just outstanding, and he is one of our honor students, and he one of our top students. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But if you see where he came from hmm. and where he is now, hmm. it would just touch your heart. Hmm. So I just want to compliment, I guess, the hmm. school staff and everyone because he, hmm. he came from a lot of obstacles. Hmm. So, and Urban, uh, Donna Tanner Harrell gave a lot of, every time a speaker came up from Urbana, she said Urbana Tigers. <laughs> so it was, it was really a great event both the celebration mm -hmm. uh, Friday night and the breakfast. So any more, anybody else have anything to say? Um, yes, I was at the celebration on Sunday night and um, in addition to the Urbana winners, they announced, and I don't know if they've ever done this before, but the two runners up were also from Urbana. Mm -hmm. They pooled money together to give them each five hundred dollars, which That's I thought right. was—I didn't know if they ever did that, but I thought that was great. So it was nice to see Urbana so well represented, and um, and as always, the community choir was amazing, and um, our own Terry Napper, who is um, in charge of the before and after school programs, was helping conduct with that. So it was really mm -hmm. uplifting to listen to everybody sing and the speeches and mm -hmm. everything was a great night. Thank you, Ann. Any more? Motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same sign. Motion passes. Meeting over.